Okay, welcome everyone to, uh, this is the second session of our seminar series on improving care for people who inject drugs with endocarditis. And we're very grateful and lucky uh, to have Tally Mugbuo Cahill joining us today to speak on a harm reduction nursing perspective on the care of people who inject drugs with endocarditis. I will be your moderator. And uh, this seminar series is brought to you by a new group that's still uh, getting organized, but it's a, a Canadian national working group on injection drug use associated endocarditis. This is our first project. So if you are interested in joining our working group, um, feel free to send me an email and we can keep you in the loop uh, moving forward. My name's Tommy Brothers. I'm an internal medicine and addiction medicine doctor uh, in Halifax, and I'm a general internal medicine fellow at uh, Dalhousie University. And I'm speaking to you uh, today from the uh, traditional and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Uh, this territory is covered by the Treaties of Peace and Friendship, which the Mi'kmaq first signed with the British Crown in 1725. The treaties did not deal with the surrender of lands and resources, but instead recognized Mi'kmaq title and established the rules for what was supposed to be an ongoing relationship between nations. We are all treaty people. Um, and I'd like to introduce uh, Tally. She's a nursing professional practice consultant at the Royal Ottawa Mental Health Care Group and a community health nurse at Sandy Hill Community Health Center. She's also the Eastern Canada representative on the board of the Harm Reduction Nurses Associ Association, which is a national advocacy group. And so uh, welcome, Tally. Thanks again for joining us. And I will hand it over to you. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm, I'm really glad to speak to you about this topic that I'm really passionate about. And I also want to say that I'm coming to you um, from Ottawa, which is the traditional and unceded uh, land of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. Um, so the learning objectives for today, I'm going to basically be talking about care interventions for people who inject drugs uh, with endocarditis. Um, I'm going to talk about, I'm kind of going to split it up to, with um, between hospital-based interventions, um, discharge, and in the community. I'm going to focus on the hospital um, just because I think there's a lot already kind of written about what to do in the community in terms of harm reduction for people who inject drugs. And I am going to speak to that, but I, there's a ton of stuff that we can do at the hospital and there's not a lot written from a nursing perspective about those interventions. So I'm going to focus on that. Um, I'm going to discuss patient teaching for each of those different parts. Although the patient teaching could be, you know, you could do some teaching that I mentioned in the community section, you could do it in the hospital. I'm just kind of talking about my, the minimum standard that I think that we should have for patient teaching for people in these different settings. And then I'm going to go over a list of resources, um, especially for people who aren't super familiar with harm reduction. So you can kind of get yourselves familiar with um, some of the resources that exist out there um, that I use in my work. Um, so many, many notes. <laughs> I have little notes. Sorry, I've written notes, so I might refer to them. But um, I am not an expert on endocarditis, and I'm not an expert on injecting drugs. But I do have and have had a passion for improving the care of people who use drugs, especially in acute care settings, ever since I became a nurse. Um, and so I speak to you from someone who's really interested in this work and has worked both in the hospital and the community with people who inject drugs, sometimes at the same time. Um, but I might be wrong about some of the things I say or, and, and feel free to put that in the chat or if you want to make additional comments, because I know there's not a lot, there, there are a lot of experts um, who are coming to, to watch this as well. Um, the other thing I should say is that I'm not going to kind of talk extensively about what harm reduction is, because I feel like I could take the whole hour talking about that. Um, and people have different definitions, whether it's, um, you know, reducing the sequelae of, of injection drug use without requiring abstinence, or is it a social movement by and for people who use drugs? And it's both of those things. Um, it's also for me as a nurse, harm reduction is is basically a reminder to me that my job is partially to reduce systemic harms and the system um, that I'm talking about for those harms is often the healthcare system and our social services system. So that's what I really feel uh, my job is as a harm reduction nurse. 
Um, I will also say that I'm speaking in Canada, from Canada. Um, and I do know that there might be some Americans who uh, are joining us today. And the context of both hospitals and harm reduction are really different and I recognize that. And so some of the interventions I'm gonna be speaking to may not fly in American hospitals. Um, also living in Ontario, Ontario is not a harm reduction paradise by any means. However, we do have supervised consumption sites and we very luckily for nurses have support both from our um, advocacy associations and from the nursing regulatory body for harm reduction. So harm reduction is an entry to practice competency for registered nurses in Ontario. Um, so it's not um, a wacky thing that you know those people do. It's something that really we all need to incorporate into our nursing practice. And you have to if you're a nurse in Ontario. The interventions I'm gonna talk about are nursing adjacent, but this presentation is not just for nurses. Um, there are absolutely interventions that other people can use, um, it, but I speak as a nurse and I do know that nurses spend most, care, most time in front of patients in acute care settings. And we can really make or break uh, a hospital stay for people when people like clients from the community come back from the hospital, they talk to me about their nursing care first and foremost, um, and less about the care that they receive from allied health and physicians. So we can really make people's experiences good. We can also make them very bad. So that's um, kind of the focus. That's why the focus of, of my talk is on nursing interventions. And I do also want to acknowledge there's a real lack of hospital policies which guide patients that are care for people who inject drugs. Um, uh, Dr. Lennox has a great uh, publication that's called uh, harm reduction, um, hospital policy is a harm reduction intervention. And I really do think that we need more policies speaking to harm reduction and nurses really love policies, even if they don't read them, even if they're making them up, but we, we talk about policy a lot. And so I think the policy is important. However, uh, you know, we don't need hospital harm reduction policies in order to treat people like human beings. And that is another important thing to remember. There is no, and I, most of what I talk about in this talk is our interventions that you can use um, in your nursing practice, which do not require policy change because it's hard to affect that change as a frontline nurse. And I recognize that. That being said, you can, you can do things to make people's care better without having that kind of corporate um, you know, backing. You know, so all of the hospitals, the USA, America, Canada, everywhere, believe in patient-centered care. And so this is patient-centered care. So your hospital supports patient-centered care, for sure it does. So this hopefully will not surprise any of the people on this who are watching this with me, but people who inject drugs actively avoid going to the hospital. Um, they describe it as being similar to jail or worse than jail is often what I hear from people. Um, they feel victimized, stigmatized, judged. They often have untreated pain and withdrawal in the hospital. They need to use drugs to treat those things. And then they are discharged or forced out of the hospital. It's an unpleasant uh, place for people who use drugs to be. And I, as someone who's worked in the community, I have convinced people who have had some of the worst wounds or they've been in bus accidents. It is very hard to get people who use drugs to go to the hospital because they know they're not gonna be treated very well. And I'm gonna, this is an example of that. So this is actually a um, published study. So I'm not outing the University of Tennessee Medical Center here, but they did a study um, and I, I'm showing this one. I have many examples. I'm showing this one because it's specific to endocarditis. So it was impact, impact of a plan of care protocol on patient outcomes in people who inject drugs with endocarditis. So their plan of care, here involved searching and removing people's belongings, um, mandatory hospital gown. You could not have your cell phone for the first week of your stay and you could not have visitors. This is the plan of care. And to me, it doesn't matter whether this plan of care worked or not because 35% of the people in the intervention group left against medical advice. So a plan of care, which, which makes the stay that unpleasant that people have to leave is not 
is not uh, patient centered and that's not harm reduction. So I thought this is interesting because they're actually kind of promoting this plan of care in this published study and you can look it up. But as soon as I saw the, the amount of people who left, I was like, well, forget all that. So don't do this. <laughs> Sorry, University of Tennessee Medical Center. So what can you do? Um, for an inpatient stay, patients should have PRN naloxone. So people inject drugs, whether or not they inject opioids or other drugs. Um, their drug supply right now is really toxic and can be contaminated with opioids, whether or not people use opioids. So they should have PRN naloxone ordered for them um, automatically. And they should be given a naloxone kit for their own use. Um, we should be making sure as nurses that their opiate agonist therapies, their methadone, suboxone, cadian, and safer supply where that's available is continued. Um, you might have to do some advocacy about the importance of those drugs, um, especially with people, um, if you're dealing with uh, new physicians who might not be familiar with how important those drugs are to people, even if they're ill. So even if people are ill, they still need their opiate agonist therapy continued. I know there's a risk of sedation, but it's very important that people maintain those, those substances that they're on. And ask the patients when they usually take these medications. It's people usually have a, they take them kind of at certain times during the day. Try not to mess that up is I guess the message that I'm trying to get across. And this might require advocacy from you as a nurse because you might be able to have this conversation about when people take these drugs and you can then kind of advocate to the admitting team like, hey, this guy, he always takes his methadone at 10 a.m. That's when he prefers to take it. For patients who use opioids, um, so short acting opioids should be ordered for multiple indications. So for pain, withdrawal, or to maintain tolerance, or they could be ordered scheduled um, with a hold for sedation. And I know as nurses, you're probably not ordering uh, these medications unless you're a nurse practitioner, but I will tell you a story of why this is so important. Uh, when I was a nurse on medicine, I was also a nurse in the community working in a supervised injection site. And I remember having a patient uh, who I recognized the name as some, one of our clients who used the supervised injection services. And I got handover from a nurse who said, hey, Mary, not her real name, she's doing great. And I said, well, she hasn't had many PRNs for pain. Oh, you know, she had some a few days ago. I don't even think she knows this PR, PRN order exists. I don't think she's even aware of it. So it's great, she's not even taking any extra opioids. And I thought, okay, this is interesting because this is someone who has injected opioids for several years. And as far as I knew, really didn't feel like they wanted to stop injecting. So I go into Mary's room and Mary looks great. And I say, hey, Mary, how are you doing? She's like, I'm doing great. I say, okay, so I noticed that you haven't had any many PRNs for pain. And she said, well, Bob here, her friend in the room, he's been helping me out with that meaning that Bob had been giving Mary drugs so she could stay out of pain, stay out of withdrawal and maintain her tolerance while she was in the hospital, which makes no sense given the dangerousness of the illicit drug supply. And Mary could be getting like, you know, regulated drugs from the hospital where people are aware of what her pain is and trying to treat it. But the nurse who was giving me handover didn't know that, didn't understand about the high risk of overdose for people who leave the hospital, didn't understand about people might having a higher opioid tolerance and really thought that she was doing a good job as a nurse by not letting this patient know about her PRN meds. And things like this happened, I think quite frequently when I was on a medicine unit in the hospital that people would, did not really understand um, that if a patient's goal was not to stop using drugs, that they weren't really helping anything by not telling people about PRN meds, and, and, and it is really quite common. So I really firmly believe that no one should leave the hospital in withdrawal. I didn't put citations here, but there is really a high risk of overdose when people leave hospitals, jails, um, rehab facilities, any settings where there might be, where they might've been abstinent either by choice or just because of the setting not allowing um, proper pain relief. Uh, the, the death rates are really high. And when we work in supervised consumption and someone says, I just left the hospital, that's someone that we keep an eye on really, really closely because we know that they're a high risk of overdose because their opioid tolerance might decrease very quickly. 
So keeping up someone's tolerance so that they you know, leave the hospital and they're not using what would have been a normal amount of opioids for them previously um, is really important because it, it can be fatal. So know that the unrelated, unregulated drug supply is highly variable. Currently in Ottawa, in Canada, um, there are a lot of benzodiazepines um, in the drug supply. So people without even intending to have become dependent on those benzos in their fentanyl and might be withdrawing from those. So kind of be aware that people might be going through benzo withdrawal as they are staying in the hospital. And even if they are getting you know, a proper amount of opioids to treat their pain and their tolerance, they might still be withdrawing from benzos. I always would take the time to make sure that I was clustering care for people who inject drugs so that their antibiotics were around meals or around pain relief. Um, so they didn't have like multiple different times that they had to do things during the day. As nurses, we, we were very task oriented and we need to get things done and the staffing is horrible right now and we just want people to fit our schedule. And that's really hard for people who use drugs who are often young people, often ambulatory people. The hospital is very boring. I was a patient before I was ever a nurse. And if you don't have a cell phone, which many people who inject drugs don't have, or don't have a tablet or don't have opportunities to have people visiting them. It can be very boring to be in the hospital. So keeping the times that you have provide patient care like all together so that people can kind of wander around and do their own thing is actually keep, gonna keep them in the hospital longer. Uh, blood work is another area and Natasha's presentation last week, which I urge everyone to watch, she talked about that that when she got blood work, that was a time when she would be really maybe stigmatized by the nurses or phlebotomists who were taking her blood just because they were looking at her veins. I have heard people say to people, what have you done to your body? Um, and obviously that is not the way we talk to our patients. Um, that's, it's often, blood work is often a time when people really face a lot of stigma and they feel a lot of shame um, about their injection drug use. So to try to remove that as much as possible, asking people what veins that they prefer people use, listening to them, listening to the patients who often have a lot of experience injecting and will know which veins work for them and which veins don't, is really important. I always think my job as a nurse is to make um, my patients stay more comfortable. Like that's a big part of my job is to keep people safe and keep them comfortable. And how do you do that with people who inject drugs is very similar to how you would do that with any other patient population. So asking about people's diet preference, um, unfortunately dental care is not, you know, easily available or cheap in Canada. So a lot of people who have been experiencing homelessness or haven't had a chance to really yeah, be able to have the ability to take care of their teeth. Their teeth aren't great. Maybe they would want a different diet with things easier to eat. Maybe they want to drink and sure ask, asking people about that and making sure to listen to them about what would make, would make them happier not to stay in the hospital given that the food isn't really great is really important offering NRT um, to people who smoke. And then opioids can be really constipating as we all know, even if people are walking around, even young people, it's not just the elderly. So advocating for a bowel protocol, asking people about their bowels the same way you would with every other patient, it's important to do that also with people who are using opioids. Another important thing is to ask for consent to call patients workers or the clinic um, that they usually are associated with as soon as possible. I think nurses who work in the hospital don't realize that people often have a whole community working for them outside of the hospital. We tend to think, and I used to think in the, in the hospital, thinking that, oh, there's no one out there. I discharge people and you know, there's no primary care, there's no system. And actually in many settings in Canada, that's not true. So here in Ottawa, we have four supervised injection sites. A lot of what people do in supervised injection sites, the staff is connect people to care and do system navigation. So letting people asking your client, can you, can I call them? Can I let them know how you're doing? Can I let them know in the, that you're in the hospital? It might be a way to make sure that that care is continued well when they're discharged. Maybe they could have people visit. Uh, there are um, 
programs here who will have peers come to advocate for clients in the hospital. And so getting that connection set up as soon as possible so people don't wonder where people went for a week is something also you can do as a nurse, it's important. So here is my other fancy design graphic that I made um, is patient whiteboard, which most inpatient nurses are well familiar with the information that you are very much supposed to put on your whiteboard, whether or not you remember to do that, whether or not you have time to do that. I write down, have written down when um, people's opiate agus therapy, their pain relief, their IV, IV antibiotics are due on that whiteboard. So the people know this is when I expect you and I'd like you to come back to the unit. This is the time when that stuff is happening. It also helps the rest of the care team know when they might be able to meet the patient in the room. I give patients the phone number for the unit. Um, I have arranged once is hard for bus tickets so people can if they leave the hospital can return. And I let people know like if their bed is gonna be endangered, like if they're gone for over 24 hours. Again, the hospital is very boring. Um, people might leave, but I'd like people to come back. And it's important that we actually encourage people to come back so they can get their antibiotics, especially at the beginning of their treatment, making sure that they have, they're getting the correct antibiotics, make sure we're, we're monitoring people's blood work that their kidneys aren't. Uh, suffering like at that beginning time during their endocarditis treatment, it's really important that they not lose their bed and that care is continued. I just read a really good article um, about medical trainees and how they feel about taking care of stigmatized or marginalized patients. Um, and I thought I really highly recommend it and I have it in my reference list, but what was interesting about it is this quote, you know, talking about people inject drugs, you know, on a medicine unit, most people are kind of in bed and we have people who inject drugs who are walking around and you know, can leave the hospital, can come back. And that is very frustrating, as I mentioned, for this very task-based nursing and medical culture that we have. But we can't get frustrated with people who want to exercise their autonomy. So yes, in some ways it is easier to take care of people who are laying in bed all day, but that is something that's weird about the hospital and weird about our culture of, of just getting things done on our schedule. Really, we're supposed to be meeting the patient's schedule. It's great if people can walk around. It's great. I know there are hospitals in the US where they don't let people who use drugs leave the hospital at all. So that is not usually the case in Canada. If people wanna go outside, if they wanna go have a cigarette, we can encourage them to come back. We can advocate for them to have their care delivered at a certain time so that they know when to come back. And that is okay. They are not messing up the system. The system is messed up. So I spoke a little bit at the beginning about reducing kind of the harm of, of systemic harm. And um, these are maybe obvious ideas of how we can improve the care for people who use drugs, people who inject drugs in the hospital. Um, Honest communication, so really being clear about when medications are going to be delivered, why certain care is going to be provided, uh, respecting people's physical space um, and their belongings. Uh, a lot of people who inject drugs also experience homelessness, and maybe, you know, you know, those belongings are really important to them. That may be all they have. I talked about treating pain withdrawal. As a nurse, I think it's your responsibility to challenge the carceral tendencies of the hospital, like security. Does, we don't need to give security to everybody who injects drugs. <laughs> um, MRSA contact precautions, which often people who are being treated with enterocarditis are often put in those precautions. Those, those should be the same precautions that anyone else with MRSA is given. It's not special MRSA pr precautions where people who inject drugs aren't allowed to leave their room because they might touch something, which is something I've seen. Um, and the last thing is advocating for harm reduction interventions uh, because that really sends the message of openness and tolerance. Um, and that leads me to, to the next topic, which is sterile supplies in the hospital setting, which I think is fairly controversial still in Canada. And there aren't a lot of hospitals that allow sterile supply provision or have policies where they actually give out sterile supplies. There's actually very few. However, recent studies show that um, inpatient, when people are treated inpatient for endocarditis, um, there are actually increased rates of mortality um, 
and of new bloodstream infections and mortality compared with outpatient treatment, which, you know, there could be a lot of reasons for that, but to me suggests that, you know, the lack of sterile supply provision for people who are in the hospital is actually making things worse. It's actually increasing infection and not increasing safety. However, even in hospitals where people do um, distribute sterile supplies, some of the policies are such that people might really feel uncomfortable asking, especially if they're not out about their injection drug use, especially people with endocarditis who might feel judged if they want to continue to inject drugs even as they experience endocarditis. So be aware that even asking for those supplies is maybe not the best way to provide them um, if you have to ask your nurse because of the thing that people might. Uh, removing sharps containers is not evidence-based um, because if people are still injecting drugs, they need a place to put their in their uh, the needles that they've used to keep you safe and to keep them safe. I thought it was really interesting um, this the study uh, Dr. Brother's study about um, needles needle exchange in hospitals because in it. Tommy, and correct me if you're wrong, I mentioned how even, a, even hospitals that had policies about um, not confiscating paraphernalia, people actually still confiscated paraphernalia in some circumstances. So if there are no policies in your hospital, let your patient know that, you know, if there are sterile supplies that they bring in, that an inReach program brings in, that you give them, like let them know whether that's supported by the hospital or not. It's important that they know that this might pick, put their bed at risk if the next nurse comes on or if security comes and tosses their room and finds stuff. It's important that they know and that they don't get kind of a mixed message. And that's the same thing for, um, for risk of OD. If someone's asking for supplies, someone wants supplies, um, also make them aware that, that in very few hospitals, there are supervised consumption sites and, very, and even fewer will offer supervised consumption for um, patients at the bedside. Um, I, I think I've only heard of one that actually offers that. So just that's why we're giving naloxone kits to people while they're in the hospital is that hopefully people can spot each other given that we're not often finding, we're not often providing these services for them while they're in patients. So patient teaching um, for the inpatient period, avoid thinking of yourself as the expert. I think as nurses, we kind of sometimes, the way we teach patients is we tell them things Oftentimes people inject drugs, have been injecting a long time and know how to, like know not to reshare needles, know not to, know how to clean sites, know about endocarditis because they've had it before. So I always approach any kind of harm reduction intervention, especially with people who may not know, you know, that I've worked in harm reduction. I approach it with a sense of curiosity of what do people know because I'm learning from them as much as they're learning from me, if not more. Um, that being said, the fact that reusing needles and not cleaning skin really increases people's risk of endocarditis. I think I see that as an opportunity uh, for education, especially while you're doing blood work um, or while you're doing another sterile thing is to talk about how, hey, cleaning the site, hey, not using the needle more than once might reduce your risk of endocarditis. At the same time, realize that if people are experiencing homelessness, it is really hard to clean your skin often. It is going to be difficult to avoid infections if we're not housing people in clean places. I also tell people about when to seek medical attention for the endocarditis, knowing that they might leave the hospital, avoid coming back. I teach them about how what a systemic infection feels like and how that often feels a little bit like withdrawal. And so if they have feeling something that feels like withdrawal where they feel kind of crappy, chills, fatigue, muscle pain, and that's not relieved by their opioid use, then, hey, maybe it's that infection is coming back or hasn't been treated properly. This is the minimum of teaching that I provide um, that I would think that people could provide. Nothing really controversial about any of this. So PICS, I promised last week I would talk about um, PICS. First, the first thing I always think people should do is draw a picture of what a pic looks like in someone's body. So you can even draw on the whiteboard a picture much like here on the left, um, just so people know that it's peripherally inserted, but that it sits or at the top right before, you know, right before the vein goes into your heart. Like it doesn't have to be complicated. 
medical terminology, just so they know it's a very long tube and it's sitting above their heart. It's not just the same as an IV. And it's important that people know that. And I think the studies have shown that some people aren't really aware of how they work. And I think that is really key because this is a device attached to someone's body. There is no real evidence um, that if we give PICC lines to people who inject drugs, that that's going to end up with more infections or increase overdoses. Um, there really isn't a lot of evidence about that when I've looked for it, when other people have looked for it. In any case, I think that it's important to teach people how the PIC works and the risks of it at a minimum when you're in the hospital. And those, mis those risks might include reinfection um, or PIC blockage or even overdose. And people might avoid using the PIC if that's really important to us that they avoid using it if you teach them about these risks. A huge one to me that I think is often ignored is that risk of overdose. So that PIC tube is quite large and can hold, depending on the model, over 1.5 mils of liquid. If you think about if someone is injecting a couple points of fentanyl, they don't, they might dilute it in a half a mil of liquid, maybe a mil of liquid. That PIC could actually hold a few injections of drugs before that injection reaches the bloodstream. So people might be, if they haven't been properly taught how to use the PIC, if, they're, if they are accessing the PIC, they could keep on trying to access it and not realize that they've put several injections of drugs in there. And then all of a sudden it all goes in at once if it's flushed. So that's why also if um, that PIC has been accessed by a patient, I would just take a waste, just, you know, if they say, hey, I've been using it, but it wasn't working, take a waste before you inject it because you could be injecting a whole lot of drugs into someone causing an overdose. And if we don't want people to use their PICs, um, then, our, then that's the other thing where we need to support other options like sterile supply, you know, policies for sterile supplies in hospitals. If it's really important to us that people not use their PICs, I don't think there is really any evidence to say that um, having a PIC encourages or enables injection drug use. People know how to inject drugs. That's how they got drug use associated endocarditis. And so that PIC is not gonna, it's, it's, it's not the enabling thing that I think that, that we think it is. And a discharge, discharge is a really important time for any patient as we know. Um, and people who inject drugs might leave before they are officially discharged uh, and be aware of that and kind of think of a plan for that patient if they, they're thinking about leaving. Connecting people with community partners is really important. If someone is new, like if you work at a hospital that's kind of like a regional hospital and someone's not, this isn't where people live and they aren't familiar with resources, it would be great to have print out for them a list of resources and whether that's supervised injection sites or clinics or needle exchange. It's not only a resource for them for those specific things, but there's often people that they can connect to in those settings that can help them and then even help them get back to the hospital if they want to come back. Avoid discharging on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I know that is really hard given the bed shortage that we have, but it really is difficult uh, to arrange PIC antibiotics. It's really difficult to make sure people's opiate agonist therapy is continued. Um, so really advocate to the team that those discharges are done at a time when we can really communicate with the outside people. And then take home naloxone, which I've mentioned many times, but it's really important. Um, if your hospital says it needs a medical directive for nurses or anyone to give out naloxone, that's debatable. We could try to challenge that, but just make it as easy as possible because people do leave the hospital before they're officially discharged and they need to have naloxone at all times and especially at discharge given the risk of overdose. So in the community um, and everywhere, but especially in the community, when someone leaves the hospital after they've been treated for endocarditis or with a PIC, if they're doing outpatient antibiotic treatment, what are the patient's goals? So your teaching and your interventions are associated with what the patient wants. So do they wanna stop their use? Do they just wanna feel better? Do they wanna avoid reinfecting? Maybe it's none of those things. So think about that when you provide your intervention. Um, connecting them with opiate agonist therapy or safer supply, or ideally an injectable opiate agonist therapy program would be great. If you don't offer that where you are, connecting them to a community resource would be wonderful. If people are, are want to continue to inject drugs and are interested in using their PIC, I believe that it is 
the standard of care to teach people how to properly use it. Um, I don't think that te patient teaching is enabling in any way. And I think, again, if a device is attached to your body and people are autonomous beings, they need to know how to use a pick in a way that doesn't hurt the pick or in a way that doesn't hurt them. And that really varies by the model of pick, but at least flushing and properly cleaning um, the hubs and using the proper connectors for the hubs is really important. And most supervised consumption sites in Canada, you can get this teaching. So if you're not comfortable providing the teaching, whether you work in home care or anything like that, you can ideally send someone, send your client to a place that can provide that teaching. Um, I think that's really important. And also the evidence shows that people, it's a real opportunity to talk about harm reduction when you provide that teaching and about proper cleaning of sites if you're properly cleaning a hub. Like it is an opportunity to connect with someone because you're recognizing their autonomy over their body. Um, and I think that that is, it's an also an opportunity to repair people's relationship with the healthcare system. If someone is interested in stopping injection drug use, whether or not, you know, maybe they want to continue using drugs in another way, there are other ways to consume drugs. Um, Natasha mentioned, you know, last week that she smoked for a while after she had endocarditis because she wanted to avoid getting an infection again. Certainly smoking is a way to reduce the risk of bloodborne infections. But as she mentioned, we also have a high rate of, of overdoses um, for people who smoke fentanyl right now or smoke meth that has fentanyl in it currently. And we also have a real lack of supervised inhalation spaces in Canada. So whereas I do feel like you can talk to people about smoking, you also have to speak to them about the risks of overdose and the fact that they unfortunately may not have the same access to harm reduction spaces that someone who injects drugs does. Um, and then other options are snorting or boofing, which is a rectal administration of drugs. If you don't feel comfortable talking about this, um, and maybe ideally someone with lived experience of substance use can speak to this. And I have, can think of many times in our very small supervised injection site um, at Sandy Hill in Ottawa, where the nurses might've mentioned, you know, snorting or boofing is like an option. And then someone else, another client would chime in and talk about their lived experience of how to do it and how it helped them avoid endocarditis and, um, or to help them recover their veins uh, for a while. And so I really think that this is a space, this is a, a teaching that some that is maybe almost best done by people with lived experience um, because they can really talk about what, how it works logistically, like how much, how it feels compared to injection drug use and provide that kind of real life experience. For avoiding endocarditis in the future, um, I spoke a little bit about this, about cleaning the injection site, using a new needle each time and making clear to people it's not about sharing needles, it's also about using a new needle so that you're not using a dull needle where you're injecting little kind of chunks of your skin into your body and keeping the needle tip sterile. So a common um, way to contaminate your needle tips is when people lick them. And I remember someone asking me, um, about well, why do people inject drugs like lick their needle tips thinking it was some kind of weird ritualistic thing and it's actually quite normal if you've ever seen a parent drop a baby soother on the ground like wash off that soother in their mouth and pop it back in which really makes no sense from infection prevention control but people do it all the time it's very normal for human beings to wash things off in their mouth and if you are injecting drugs often you holding that needle, you're not really, that might not be top of mind in terms of like the transmission of germs. So kind of reminding people about that in a way that's not stigmatizing might help prevent endocarditis in the future. There's also a lot of literature that suggests, a few studies that suggest the a correlation between gender to women um, getting endocarditis and having an increased risk, um, possibly because um, they, you know, someone else is prepping the drugs for them and maybe isn't cleaning the site as well, maybe isn't thinking about infection prevention as well. And also women often access supervised consumption sites less often than men. So it is a very important harm reduction intervention to teach people how to inject themselves. Uh, that is really, really important. As much as I support peer assisted injection in our supervised injection sites, people need to know how to inject themselves for their own safety it's always gonna be safer to inject yourself, whether you're talking about overdose risk or people stealing your drugs or risk of endocarditis. 
The last thing, and there's probably a lot of things, the last thing, you know, major thing for avoiding endocarditis is a proper drug preparation. This is kind of a difficult one because the literature is a little bit contradictory. Um, we know that long-acting hydromorphone, so there's controlled release formulations, um, you know, for a few studies have shown there's a higher risk of endocarditis with those medications. Um, at the same time, you know, as there's been increasing use of like things like Cadian, so in Canada. So hot prep of tablets can kill the bacteria which cause endocarditis. At the same time, and someone's gonna gotta correct me if I've got this mechanism wrong, but if the um, hot prep can also melt the waxiness of the beads in those controls release, and so you're not injecting an entirely dissolved liquid. You're injecting little granules that might cause endothelial damage. So damage to the lining of the heart and heart vessels. And that's a really good place for bacteria to stick. So the BCCDC um, has really, like they talk about this, they have a lot of resources about safer tablet injection, um, but they they come up with the idea that cold prep is probably safer than hot prep. Um, although there are risks and benefits to both. So if you really want to get into to it, there's a lot of resources in that. But just know that what I tell people is ideally you're not injecting controlled release medications that if it's if you're injecting pills that um, instant release are a lot more easier to dissolve and a lot less likely to cause harm to your heart. So lastly, I'm just going to present a few resources um, quickly because I'm running out of time while people ask questions. So basics, stigma, using correct language to talk about people will make them feel more welcome. I often paste this in the nursing station or in the staff room, or I put it in paper charts back when we have paper charts, just so people won't use really ugly terminology. If you want to know more about um, substance use in acute care settings, really the best resource um, is one from Alberta, Management of Substance Use in Acute Care Settings. Um, and there's also one put out by CRISM um, that specifically talks about COVID-19, um, but is really useful for, for whenever COVID ends, whenever that might be. Um, another document specifically for, well, could be for anyone, but specifically made for nurses, by nurses, was about providing a culturally safe care in hospital settings and building, rebuilding trust with people who use drugs. If you want to know more about infection, uh, harm reduction, uh, prep of drugs, how to properly use um, sterile equipment, um, the KD best practice recommendations have recently been updated and they're very comprehensive and include uh, literature citations for those of you who like to look at the literature. Um, another one that's kind of written from a really clinical standpoint on their paper is about the six moments of infection prevention for injection drug use. I don't love all the language in it, but I do think if for people who want something kind of really medicalized um, to guide their practice of how to reduce infection, um, it's not a bad paper. So my two leapaways are to be prepared to provide care and teaching which respects patient goals. It's really important that if, you're, if your patient does not want to stop injecting drugs, you telling them stop injecting drugs and that's that you'll never get endocarditis again is not going to be helpful. At the same time, if someone says, I'm never injecting drugs again, can, trying to offer them safer injection teaching can be a little tone deaf, can be a little bit uh, um, not respecting of, of where they are in their recovery journey. Um, providing good care for people who inject drugs requires that you be an advocate. Even, this, even, even providing the standard of care requires advocacy and whether that's advocacy for a certain patient or system-wide advocacy, there, unfortunately, we're not at the point yet where that the standard of care for, for people inject drugs is just, is just accepted in hospital settings. And then I have references if anyone wants to get a copy of these slides. And that's my presentation. Thank you so much, Tally. That was uh, really awesome and full of. Oh God, there's a lot in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was answering some questions oh, and good. sharing some links to the papers you were talking about and that kind of thing. Um, so no need to uh, no need to um, uh, scroll all the way back up there. There were a couple of questions in there as well, which I can uh, bring up. Um, 
but yeah, I just want to acknowledge how um, how many practical suggestions there were in everything you were presenting, um, like that don't require you know comprehensively changing the policy of the hospital or that will cost a lot of money. But we're really focused on improving patients' care experiences and helping to support them to stay in hospital and receive their needed care. So that was really really wonderful. Yeah, if you um, listen to patients, like they ask for supervised consumption, but they ask for people to be nice to them and treat them like human beings. And that I think is something that we can do starting today if we're not doing it already. Yeah, definitely. Um, I welcome people to put uh, questions in the chat, which I can help moderate or read out or raise your hand um, with the little reaction button. And you could unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, we had one question from Marie Pollack that was asking about the role of specialized addiction medicine teams in hospitals and how common they are and, and what kind of difference that might make. They are not very common. I mean, I think the literature shows that they do make a difference um, for sure. They aren't very common here in Canada for funding reasons and um, for other political reasons, probably. When I did a scan of the literature addiction medicine consult teams, also there's not a lot of nurses involved in them. And I think that's partially funding, but partially people not really thinking about the fact that, you know, nurses, we don't get a lot of substance use care um, education in our nursing school. And then we're kind of thrown out there and we don't have a ton of opportunities for professional development. I imagine any, a lot of nurses who would want to watch this presentation would not be able to watch it unless it was on recording that they're watching when they're not paid. So, because it's hard for us to do even regular kind of uh, normal, like teaching to nurses just because of the, the staff shortages and everything like that. So have, I think that having a nurse on those teams is really important because they can really speak to this kind of patient care aspect of it in a way that a, a social worker probably couldn't or a physician probably couldn't because they're not necessarily thinking about kind of like everyday care interventions. Yeah, that's, those are great points. And um, I just want to follow up with my own question on that about um, you mentioned the kind of logistical scheduling uh, employment barriers for nursing continuing education. Um, we uh, have been trying to do education sessions around substance use at our hospital, and I imagine many people on this call have um, been doing some similar things. Do you have advice about what are effective or practical or accessible ways to, um, you know, reach bedside nurses or wow. is, it, is it flexibility? Is it recordings if people aren't getting paid for that time or do you have any advice about that? I think it's all of those things. I think to me, I think that's why having nurses specifically who have substance use harm reduction education and have, and like that's part of a clinical educator role. I do know that there's a hospital in Ontario right now that's hiring a, a nurse educator for substance use, because then you can do that bedside on the spot stuff. You can look at charts and see like, hey, you know, which I've done like, that's maybe not the best language to use or why do we choose this intervention? Like I think nurses really respond to, um, or, or quick in services that are five or six minutes. Um, I think we need to have all different kinds of education, but like providing nursing education is a big part of my role now. And it's really, it's really hard to do without staff dedicated to do it really know the subject area and that's unfortunately a difficult investment for hospitals so I think it 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 has to be modules and training and orientation and probably needs to be all of those things unfortunately to really reach everyone hmm. yeah those are some great thoughts as well um we had a question if you could talk a little more about what is known or what is the existing literature around the risks associated with injecting in picks and I will say up front uh, Vic Weaver uh, has responded to that comment saying she's going to dig into that in the last session in the seminar series awesome. on June 28. Um, but if you if you wanted to just speak uh, to it a little more right now, it'd be great as well. I mean, I think that one thing is hard in the literature is that we don't know. Like, so if someone gets has a reinfection, um, we don't know whether that was because of a pick or not. When I looked at some of the literature, like I don't think that there have been a lot of treatment failures associated with people injecting into their picks, and I think it would be really it'd be again, it would be hard to prove that. Um, I think that, you know, the, I think it's one of those things, oftentimes when I hear about hospitals having policies against the PICS, it's because of this idea either of liability, especially in American hospitals, or of enabling substance use. And the liability thing, like I am ignoring that, but the enabling substance use risk is um, an interesting one because when I've seen people in supervised injection sites use their, people usually know to avoid using their picks. When they're using their picks to inject is often because they have 
very few veins that left that are accessible and Natasha spoke to that or there are veins that they want to avoid using. They don't want to avoid using injecting their jugular. They want to avoid injecting into their groin. Um, and so using the pick is a better option to them for that. It gives their vein a rest. And then if you're in like really extreme withdrawal, it's sometimes really hard to inject. And like and people might be struggling, especially at the beginning of the day and might use their pick just for that first injection. So then they can use their veins for the rest of it because just get their hands steady. So like as much as there are, are risks, and I'm glad someone's going to delve into that more because I feel like I could have done a whole long presentation on that. I do think for people who use drugs, there are also benefits to them for using their picks. And I think that we kind of have to respect that um, and then not try to feel like we need to control people's behavior so much. Again, it's a device connected to their own body, like for them. <laughs> Those are really great points. Thank you. I see Michelle's unmuted herself. Do you have a question, Michelle? No, my apologies. That was an accident. <laughs> okay. We had a couple of comments in the chat um, about kind of multidisciplinary uh, work in the hospital. Katie Lines, who's a colleague of mine in Halifax, who has some experience uh, supporting harm reduction care in the hospital, mentioned that pharmacists can be really helpful sourcing alternative brands, uh, for example, okay. for immediate release formulations if patients have a preference or they're planning to crush and inject something that might dissolve better. Um, so to, to start those conversations. That's a really good point. And I think that that's, um, I, I highly recommend people look at the um, BCCDC's safer tablet injecting resources because those things, they update them quite frequently and those things change all the time. And, you know, it's, it's true that people find that, you know, sometimes name brand um, medications are much easier to dissolve. And, and so really like, you know, if you are able to have enough for people to have enough trust in you to have that conversation, I think that's great. And then involving pharmacy, like we also need pharmacy, harm reduction pharmacists to, to kind of join the team as well. And another uh, comment slash question, Kim Dreddy in Newfoundland, who's a member of our national working group, um, was mentioning that she's wondering or thinking that much of the human resource requirements to make up a multi, an effective multidisciplinary care team for people who use drugs already exist in hospitals, except for peer supports, and wondering if costs are the relatively low, but administrative will is the main barrier. Um, sure I think you, you mentioned before yeah. also just that professionals in all these different roles may not have that much Experience, existing experience and training related to totally. I mean, I have worked with peers or community health workers a lot in the community. I think people in the hospital don't even really think about that. And the way we think of patient and family involvement in care isn't, you know, isn't the same way it's thought of in the community. So we'll have like families give comments on policy or invite them to a meeting. That's not the same as having um, peers provide care and provide patient teaching. And I think there's a discomfort generally in hospitals with having unregulated healthcare providers giving healthcare advice. I think that we need to get over that. I think that they can really help navigate the system inside the hospital and out. Um, but I think that's, that's gonna be a hard sell for a lot of hospitals. And, and I don't think money is the huge barrier, but I think people just don't even know what to, how, who would manage them or how, what to do or what the risks would be because they probably have an idea of what those risks are. And they really need to look at their, to their community partners um, for guidance on that. And I think that's another thing that I wanna say is for those of us lucky to have, uh, lucky enough to have supervised consumption sites um, in the cities that we work in, like really like they're part of the healthcare system and we can reach out to them for guidance on how to do things. It's not just a separate thing that happens out there. Like there are healthcare partners and they have a lot of resources and have a lot of knowledge that we can benefit from. You'd mentioned taking advantage of that in terms of like for each individual patient, like getting consent to call and collaborate on a care plan and a discharge plan. Um, are, are you now talking about like inviting them in to give education sessions or inviting them to be part of the inpatient care team or all of the above? Like all of it, like all, I mean, I think that there's a lot of education. I mean, I've worked in both places. There's a lot of education that a lot of like most of what I learned about drugs I learned from sitting and talking to people who use drugs or watching people use drugs. Or like that, and that knowledge is often knowledge that is like it's very important. It's often knowledge that like nurses have because they work in the sites, harm reduction workers, social workers, obviously people who use drugs, and that it's hard to publish that knowledge. It's hard to put that out there in formal settings because we're not that the community isn't monetized that way, and because we don't necessarily like 
you know, have protected time to do that. So the only way to get that knowledge um, about the drug supply, about safer injection is really like bring people in, in, in all ways, like bring people from the community in. And that actually will help all healthcare. Like that's not just an intervention for people who inject drugs, but like for mental health settings, for, you know, we, we, we have this dichotomy, like this binary of hospital and community that actually is really serving to, to, to make healthcare in Canada worse. So I'm, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, I always think of like harm reduction in a hospital setting is like, is interesting, not only, you know, to improve the care of people who use drugs, but also as a, as an example that could be set for, for how to incorporate, how to really do patient centered care for everybody. Definitely. I, I agree with that. Uh, totally. Um, we have a couple minutes left, so I'd invite any more questions in the chat or raise your hand. And in the meanwhile, I could ask one last one. Um, an issue that comes up for us sometimes related to nursing care and hospital is if we've implemented that plan to have short acting uh, opioids like you recommended, and then patients are going off the unit and, and seem to be coming back intoxicated. And we've said, you know, hold for sedation or PRN, and they're asking for their as needed dose of opioids. How do you advise nurses uh, make that clinical assessment on whether to give a, a dose of a scheduled opioid or a PRN opioid for people when we've put a plan in place to support, you know, support withdrawal management and pain. Yeah, I think that, you know, hold for sedation maybe to me as a shorthand for actually like using a sedation scale would be helpful. Like, so it's not your subjective experience, but what is actually really happening and what is sedation and what's intoxication? Cause I think people just make assumptions. So like um, I think using a validated tool for that would take a little bit of that opinion out of it. I think being open with the patient before they leave and say, hey, and this happens all, patients are actually really used to this because you can't get your methadone dose in community if you're intoxicated and people know that and they'll wait a little bit before asking for their methadone because they know the pharmacist will refuse them. Just to explain that the system is very similar inside the hospital. Like, hey, if you go out and you come back, and it looks like you're too sleepy to get this, I won't be able to give it to you. And we'll have to wait till the next time or wait a couple hours. I think you, that's part of the honest communication thing and explain, you know, can explain this hospital policy, explain this for their safety, but I think people will appreciate that. And they'll be really familiar with that if they've, if they've been on opiate agonist therapy before. Awesome, thank you very much. Um, there is a comment in the chat, I'll just point your attention to Tali, maybe we could connect offline with Kate Lena. I'm looking for advice if there's existing policies or approaches to uh, policies supporting distributing harm reduction equipment in more traditional healthcare settings or addiction uh, treatment clinics and that kind of thing. Yeah, that's a hard one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Thanks so much. Um, so we will, we're out of time, so we'll, we'll wrap up there. I want to thank you again, Tally, for coming and sharing uh, your wisdom and experience, all the practical tips. Um, it was really inspiring and motivating. Um, we have recorded the session. I'm just going to stop the recording now. If I can. And if anyone wants the slides, especially to correct me if I've said something wrong or miscited your paper, then um, 